When I was going through the thick of the depression, I would close every window, every drape in the house, and I would pin it to the wall and or tape it down so the light didn't even creep in when it was daytime. Wow. That's how much light scared me, the outside mm -hmm. scared me. And so that morning at about five, I'm not exactly sure of the exact time, but I knew there was sunlight and sunlight crept into the room. You're listening to God Hears Her, a podcast for women where we explore the stunning truth that God hears you, He sees you, and He loves you because you are His. Find out how these realities free you today on God Hears Her. Welcome to God Hears Her. I'm Elisa Morgan. And I'm Erin Eddy. Fear is such an overwhelming feeling. It can make us run and hide, freeze in place, or completely shut down our personality. For Julie Thomas, fear became a constant companion after the birth of her second son. Her diagnosis of postpartum depression brought with it a deep darkness that caused her to block out the light in every way possible. Julie is a wife, a mother of two, life coach, and author. The release of her novel, Hope Inside Out, and her willingness to be open and transparent has allowed her to find healing for herself and to help others do the same. Join us on this episode of God Hears Her as we learn about Julie's big life change and her path of healing. My upbringing was in the Middle East in a Gulf nation. It's called Kuwait. Mm -hmm. Probably heard of it during the big war in the 1990s. But that's where I grew up and I moved here after I met my husband and I've been here for 20 plus years now. And you're meaning Dallas or do you mean mm -hmm. the United Dallas States? And yeah, United States, yeah. but Dallas in general. And it, we've been here ever since. Yeah. This is this is home now. So tell everybody, what did you think your life would look like compared to what it does look like? I mean, growing oh, up, did you imagine? No, totally different. I was a journalist and I wanted to go down the whole journalism route. Wow. Got my master's in journalism and communications, moved here, got my doctorate in journalism and information as well. So you're serious about this topic. Yes, Goodness. I yeah. was. But my story, it starts right at the same month that I got my diploma for my doctorate in hand and the diagnosis for postpartum the very same month. Wow. So it totally changed my dreams, my route. Never imagined being where I am now you know i was thinking i'd be teaching somewhere or more in the academic arena but totally took a detour mm -hmm. life took a detour yeah. take us into that then you know what was your life like as you were getting your phd you're married now you're living in the yeah. dallas area yeah. and what's your life like well uh we were plugged into our church i had my older son when I was at my second year of my PhD and he comes along and I'm, you know, raising him and doing school at the same time. That's a lot. He, he was an easy baby, so I was able to still do school, manage home and everything. But then I got pregnant with the second son and the pregnancy was fine. But once the delivery happened and I came home, it was a different person that walked in through the doors and a different... A totally different experience of bringing the baby home. It was nothing like the first one. It was uh, something that I wasn't prepared for. So immediately there was yeah, such a difference. What did you notice? What were your symptoms? And did you even yeah. recognize them as symptoms at first? Well, no, mm -hmm. no, because everything is just happening. And uh, in my case, mm -hmm. once we brought the baby home, it started to it literally happen in my head. So... There's the reality of being a new mom with a baby and a two and a half year old child. A few months before he turned three was when his brother was born. And uh, so I have the little ones and home and I'm still in my final semester of grad school. And then I come home and my reality and my head are in two different places. And this is the best I can explain. My head started to be in a different world where I was in, still in the hospital. I'm still in the hospital where I had the baby. I'm still seeing the hallways. I'm still seeing the postpartum floor. Uh, and I am frantically pacing up and down the hallway. And I'm trying to look for something. I'm not sure what it is at that moment, but I'm, when I'm pacing, I'll come across like an empty baby cart. And this is all in my head. This is not in front of my eyes. Because you're actually at home. 
I'm home with the baby in my arms. Almost like hallucinating or... Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, totally different disconnect from reality. And I started to... I see the empty baby cart and then this feeling of uh, loss. Like I lost the baby. The baby's not in there. Oh. And then I would hold the one that's in my arms healthy and just weep like he's gone. Oh. It was oh. so hard to explain to anybody, to my husband, to myself, for forget. I'm sure, <laughs> right? You're like, what is happening? This, yeah, this should not be happening. Coming home with a newborn, yes. right? Yes. So it was just so hard to explain to anybody. I had two realities because the other one was as real to me as the reality that I was in. Feeding so. the baby and living in your home and taking mm-hmm. care of your two and a half year old and. Yeah. Man, Julie, how did you begin to figure out that something was off? Honestly, because I was so in it, the two kids trying to wrap up grad school, that life, and then this life in my head and trying to get everything done in the house, I wasn't able to pull away and figure out what is going on. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I couldn't even ask myself that question because that became so much of my reality Mm -hmm. that I I really didn't have or even think of pulling away and asking myself what's going on. All I knew is uh, I was different. My husband and I started to fight more and because, you know, he's not understanding where I'm coming from because I couldn't tell him this. Mm -hmm. I didn't tell him this because it sounds like I'm insane and so uh, my head is at odds with me and Mm -hmm. and then there's the odds now happening in the family life and everything just started to clash uh, and Mm. just brought so much chaos in my head uh, and in my life. What was the breaking point for you when you started to shed light on what was going on and what you were seeing and feeling? One of the big ones that started to manifest in my life was when the day would end and it's nighttime, everything is quiet, and you become quiet, you're settled down, you're not busy with the bustle of taking care of the kids. And what happens is this thing in my head starts to speed up, and I'm guessing it had to do with the anxiety, like Mm -hmm. it's on fast forward, and I had zero control over this fast forward button. There was no way I could pull the remote from it. press pause or slow down it just kept pacing and the pacing got harder I'm searching for a baby it got so bad that I would just spring out of the bed like at two or three in the morning and just run out the door because get away from this Uh, I really don't know how I did all that like it just wasn't reality reality and not reality at the same it was really really conflicting and all I remember is it would get so overwhelming that Mm. I would just spring out of bed and just run and Mm -hmm. my husband would have no warning or anything and neither would I and I'd be barefoot pajamas everything out on the street and then he would like we had the baby so I packed them up Mm. and come looking for me and uh, I would run till energy caved you know till that rage or whatever was going through my head would give me enough energy to just keep running like a mad person and then stop because I had no more energy left. So that's what was going on. And that's one of the biggest, oh, what is going on? And uh, we still really didn't do anything about it because we were not sure, again, to step away and go, what is this? Mm -hmm. We we were lost, but a friend of ours had been in our life for a whole year before I had this baby and they Mm -hmm. knew I was different and they had gone through the experience and he asked my husband to, you know, I would go see a doctor to make sure because I think she might be going through a postpartum Mm -hmm. because she's not the same person Mm -hmm. that we knew. Mm -hmm. So that motivated us to go see the doctor and it was definitely an immediate diagnosis. How long did this go on, Julie? The whole duration of depression in general lasted six years. Postpartum was supposed to be like, ending in a year is that's what the usual shelf life is but mine just I still remember when my baby the youngest one he's much older now when he was three I would still weep Mm. I would still hold him and he's asleep and weep and not know what's going on and like I said he's still in my arms and I would just weep like uh so I'm guessing that postpartum went at least some traces of it continued into that time frame Mm. But depression is a whole uh, almost six years. Mm. 
What a toll this has to have taken. Tell us, how did you come to know God? And and what was your relationship with God like before it, during, Mm. you know, even as you continued? Well, I grew up in the church. So my whole life, everybody in the family has been Christian. And, you know, that's all I've known. So I didn't know anything besides the Christian faith and to do the right things like go to church and do your Bible reading and your prayers. You know, I had all that down. But this comes along and this opens up a whole new window of communication with God for Mm -hmm. me in terms of first it was help me, help me, help me, help me get out. Please help me get out. Please help me get out. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, fighting him to let me get out of this as much as I could. And then it went from there to rage, Mm -hmm. anger at God. It went to me even uh, making vows to myself shaking my fist at heaven and saying, I'm never going to raise my boys to know you. Wow. That kind of rage and anger. It sounds like Lord. you felt so abandoned, yes. so alone yeah. from this yeah. God that you thought loved you mm-hmm. and would yeah. leave you in this condition. I would say that it even opened up my uh, questioning myself as to where I stood with the Lord. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't sure. think I fully embraced how much he loved me or where his love for me stood till I got to this stage in life. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, he's all I knew. So I did everything that is by the books. And I, my parents taught me, my grandparents taught me. I just did everything that they did. And, you know, faithfully went to church, did all that. But when this comes along, and as much as I was angry with God, it took me back to, did you ever really seek that relationship with him? And when the rage and everything would die down and then you're stuck with you and God again, there's nobody else in the picture. Mm-hmm. Nobody else can help me. I'm stuck with him. And it came down to, Lord, this is me and you. What do you need me to do from here? Mm. And that's, I feel like a good place in my relationship with the Lord started during this difficult time. I don't think I would have been able to embrace that or even experience that if I had stayed where I was. I'd still be doing the right things, most likely, still sending my kids to Sunday school and going to church and everything, because that's Mm -hmm. all I've known. But then where's the experience with your creator? Where's the embracing of that in my life as I walk through life? Because at the end, it's him and me. When we stand in front of him, it's going to be him and me. And I didn't have that, even though I, I loved the Lord and accepted him at a young age and everything. I was lacking that. And I think this opened up that window for me. Mm. And as much as it was painful, uh, I am grateful for that revelation of understanding who he is truly. You know what I love about your story, Mm. Julie, is that your testimony is showing that our God is so confident in who he is and how he loves and pursues us that even our anger does not deter him from us. Mm -hmm. In fact, it builds intimacy with yeah. us. And yeah. that's what happened in your story. I think so many people that are listening right now, they may be carrying a lot of anger that they've stuffed or hid yeah. or are scared to show him, but he is so confident. He's so confident in his love for us that even our anger yeah. will not scare him away. So when your anger would settle down, would you withdraw more or would you lean in more day by day, minute by minute, kind of with your relationship with God? I think at first I would feel like I can't come to him because I've been so upset and I've been so angry. But like I I always say to people that I share my story with, I always go back to Peter when he said, where are we going to go, Lord? When Jesus asked them, are you going to leave me too? And he said, Lord, I I have no place else to go. Where are we going to go? And I always feel that with the mm-hmm. Lord. And I was like, I had no place else to go. And I went. Mm-hmm. And I, was, mm-hmm. I always thought, if I shook my fist at somebody I know in my life, how bad would that be going even today, most likely? Like, and you shake your fist at someone in anger. And yeah. it's still going to be an issue as much as if the person forgives you or not. It doesn't matter. It's still going to yeah. be there. And I was, still, I was able to go back to him. And I was able to see how... Like the word says, he first loved me. So it was not because of anything I was doing or not doing that I was able to go back. He first loved me and he was still there. So even when the anger happened and I walked away and I I came back, it's not like he left. Mm -hmm. So he was there. And Mm -hmm. so I started to build that confidence in my relationship with the Lord because hey, he loved you first anyway. You know, in story after story that we listen to, Aaron, 
you know, whether it's um, abuse or maybe it's a body image issue or an eating disorder, or, or maybe it's um, an incredible season of loneliness or you, on and on and on and on, all of the issues that we all have. It floors me that the quote answer, and I'm using air quotes here, is coming to the realization that God loves me and there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. So there, you know, and, and this crossroads of God wooing us into, well, kind of like marinating in that truth so that, yes. you know, it's part of our being and we really can't shake it off and walk away from it. But how right. how he does that in each yeah. one of our lives is so it's personal. Custom. Yeah. <laughs> Julie, yeah. take us into the customized mm. path that God led you on mm. to woo you to this truth. And then what kinds of tools did he use in your life? Was it a bibbity bobbity boo bing you're done or was it a process? What was it therapy? What what worked eventually? Well, I wanted the fairy godmother. I wanted the, yeah. you know, the immediate answer. Yeah. And we were hoping that if we went and got prayed over at different places, that I would get that answer. So I wanted the immediate answer. Mm-hmm. And I kept pushing and asking for that. And, you know, frustrated, angry, still asking, Lord, I still trust you. Heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me. And there was no answer to that. Mm-hmm. And then I was at my church one day and it was a women's event and it was a night of comedy and, you know, it was packed and there were games and prizes and a lot of comedy going on. It was, everybody was having fun. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there in the middle of my church and it's home and I know everybody. And I'm feeling like this is not mm-hmm. my home. I don't know anybody here. Nobody knows me. What am I even doing here? I'm feeling like I'm alone, isolated. I'm feeling all these feelings that a person who's sitting next to friends should not be experiencing. Mm, Right. And it's like, you're alone. What are you even doing here? Nobody here cares. And, you know, leave, leave, and that kind of stuff. And Mm. and during the night, and I come home, and once the little ones were put to bed, I go get into bed, and I still suffered with uh, insomnia at that time. And so I would stay up for most of the night and either read or watch TV. But that night I stayed up, and it was this battle. Because these feelings would not go away. This heaviness, this you're isolated, you're alone, you're, you're, you know, nobody cares. That feeling would not go away. Mm -hmm. And when I was going through the thick of the depression, I would close every window, every drape in the house, and I would pin it to the wall and or tape it down so the light didn't even creep in when it was daytime. Wow. That's how much light scared me. The outside Mm -hmm. scared me. And so that morning at about five not exactly sure of the exact time, but I knew there was sunlight and sunlight crept into the room somehow into my bedroom. And when that was coming in, there was this strong, strong, strong dawning on my heart. Like I've never heard the voice of the Lord or anything and I cannot claim to that, but this dawning was, you know how you felt in that room with that many women sitting among your friends and you felt alone and isolated and lonely. And there are several others like you sitting in the dark Mm. in those chairs and I need you to share your story now Mm. so Mm. of course you're then going I don't think I heard the (laughs) Lord right you're like what's that that can't be (laughs) no No, because you know I follow women that Mm. love the Lord and share the gospel and everything and yes they all have really painful backstories but then what I'm seeing in front of me is their you know, their success and what they're encouraging people with. And I didn't have any, any of that to offer. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, what place am I coming from? I'm still struggling. I'm mm-hmm. still trying to get through day to day, still waking up with this dread of not wanting to get through the day. I was like, I don't want to be here today. That kind of feeling every yeah. day. And so I'm like, I can't share my story. There's nothing going on to share here besides all this pain and despair. But he started to push me. I can't explain it. It was just a nudge that Mm. was light enough and gentle enough to where I knew I had to obey. And it was not like a compulsion, but I was like, I have to obey this. It's coming from such a loving place. Mm. I have to obey this. And I started to start to share in small groups, started to tell people, this is what I'm going through. And sure enough, people that I actually knew started to come out and say, Hey, I didn't know you were going through this. I am, Ah. I am going. Mm. And so suddenly you're not so alone. No. That feeling that I experienced for those few hours that night, through the night and through that event was what everybody else is feeling. 
And he let me go through that experience, like getting on a ride at a park and then you get off the ride. So it was like that ride I was on and I experienced everything people actually go through. And when I got off the ride and I started to share my story, I still I have a clear memory of a friend of mine that came forward and said, this is what I'm going through as well. And we were, I started to meet people in coffee shops and share my story and hear theirs back. And I found a lot of healing Mm -hmm. in that. Mm -hmm. And I I always tell people that I feel like God healed me. And I have this pie chart of different avenues he used Mm. to heal me. And one of them was sitting face to face with people Mm -hmm. that are struggling like me. And a friend Mm -hmm. of mine sat across from me and she said, you know, I'm so grateful that you shared your story when you did. Because if you had shared it after you got all your answers, she said, I wouldn't have given you a year. Gosh. And to know that there's somebody out there that will share a story because they feel exactly like I am feeling right now. Mm. She said, I can believe you more. I want to hear your words more. And then so that that confirmed it for me. It's like, Mm. uh, you're kind of crazy. You're still under the diagnosis. Mm. You're not probably hearing from the Lord, you know, and you doubt yourself. And I did. That's such a good principle, Julie. You know, we think we have to be all done and tied up with a bow, you know, for God to use us. And (laughs) and the reality is you're right. You know, I mean, there are seasons to be quiet for sure. But, you know, the the reality that God led you to share from the very middle, the midst of your pain is so powerful. And I really want to underline, this was a long process. So what were some of the other tools or opportunities that that God laid for you? Yeah, it came down to, uh, I started to journal Mm -hmm. and I found a lot of healing in journaling where every word I was writing to the Lord, I just wrote from my heart. I didn't hide it. I didn't have to, like you said, put a bow on it. And that was an expression. And I felt I got a lot of healing as I wrote to the Lord. And then growing up, I always grew up with a reading plan. And when my life got so desperate, I was not getting much from the reading plan. Mm. So I started to like open the word of God and start to desperately search for somebody that struggled like me, Mm. somebody had had words like me. And so the word of God started to open up in front of me and I started to see people that were struggling Mm. and suffering and Mm. people that we don't usually put on our podiums and platforms and People, we have all the big stories of valor and everything, but where's their backstories? Mm-hmm. Where, how many times did God tell Joshua not to be afraid? Isn't it obvious that he was afraid? Mm-hmm. Like, so I started to see so much of me in the Word of God, our humanity, our mm-hmm. frailty, and God didn't choose to hide it from the Word of God. And I was like, mm-hmm. okay. And then when I started to share my story, there was a big release in my heart from, oh, you know keeping it all in me and within me and hiding it under the rug. And culturally, we come from a place where it's very honor, shame driven. And we're like, you know, just go get prayed or uh, go get some medicine or go eat more or, you know, that kind of stuff. And so when I started to share, there was some freedom I was experiencing there. When I started to hear other people share their stories, there was another part of my freedom there. When I started to speak into their lives, Again, another part of my freedom started to show up there. And then God led me to write a book. Again, my whole journal was put into this book. And I was like, whoa, and put it out there when I wasn't fully ready either. Mm -hmm. Again, another part of my freedom. So it was so Mm -hmm. many. And yes, we sought medical help as well. I did counseling. My counselor was a big part of my healing. Mm -hmm. I regularly sought prayer. I did a Bible study in my home just from the place that I was at. And I just here's what I have to offer and let's all just share this carpet on my living room together and we would just Mm -hmm. all end up on our carpet and (laughs) just share each other's hearts Mm -hmm. and cry and pray and so my healing came in so many of those avenues it did not come with the immediate touch of a wand Mm -hmm. which I wish Mm -hmm. and I've seen miracles I've seen miracles in my family Mm -hmm. happen like that and people supernaturally healed and I truly truly believe in that but um, for some reason, he didn't choose that for me. Yeah. And I feel like my healing would be here and I would be done and I would be forgotten. And the healing would be forgotten most likely, yeah. but I can never forget this healing or this path. I think it's so brave and just, it's a beautiful thing that God prompted you to share in the midst mm-hmm. of yeah. your healing versus coming on the other side. You know, we're always looking for what's the formula and, you know, what are my nine yeah. steps and what number am I on the Enneagram? And the reality, you just, 
you just sank down into the reality with God and he met you. How did this journey affect your marriage, affect your children, your family? (laughs) Yeah, that's a fun one, I'm sure. It's an honest conversation. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Honest question. Oh my gosh. Yeah, we went through so much uh, in our marriage. Like it was a lot of confusion for my husband, like I said. Because I couldn't explain what was going on with me to him. He's chasing you down streets with children in the car. Yeah, hello. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he helped me with the kids at home and everything. Mm. But besides that, it was very hard for him. When I was like, I need help, I need prayer, I need somebody to know that, you know, this is happening. And he was very hesitant because he was like, how do we tell people this? Like, you know, Mm -hmm. so there was... A shame yeah. factor that he battled with as well. Sure, sure. And when there were days when I couldn't peel myself off this condition to go outside and face people because it was just so overwhelming for me. It was hard for him because he's like, what am I going to tell people? How do I tell people that you're not here? What is the reason you're not here for so many weeks? So there's so many challenges that we both faced. And of course, the kids, oh my goodness, is just... But by the grace of God, that they are who they are today and serving God and they love the Lord. But it was hard. I really feel like the Lord raised those kids for me because there were times when I wouldn't recognize the babies and go just sitting there and going, who are these kids? And this was at the beginning until one of them dropped something or let out a squeal or something. And you snap back to reality and you're like, oh, these are my babies. So there was that... Uh, darker place in terms of how the children were affected too you know we did our best to still love on them and take care of them and you know I hope to God that none of this has settled in their hearts except for the they're they're watching mom now walk around and share her story and uh, like you know my older son helped me set up everything here and so they become very much a part of the journey Mm -hmm. love that Mm -hmm. none of us signed up for this but we've been all pushed into this uh, forefront Mm. and sharing all of us sharing little aspects of our story with whoever needs to hear it and god knows who needs to hear it at the right time i just think it's so what a gift to give your children this type of honesty and transparency of your journey because i mean now they get to be a part of the restoration and really experience it i just that's so beautiful i think so many of us feel so helpless when someone we love is is suffering in the ways you're describing i know there are women listening right now and maybe their struggle is a heaviness or a depression or maybe it's something else but there's great fear that is gripping a fear of i can't admit this i'm going to be thrown out of wherever I am, my job, my home, my church, my small group, my friendships, uh, my marriage, I'm going to be thrown out. If if I come clean and say, this is what my life is really like. Yeah. Julie, for, for a minute, can, can you speak to her? Can you challenge her, comfort her, uh, wrap your voice around her and, and give her something to hold on to? Fear is real. And in, with this illness, I experienced it too immensely, immensely to the point where, like I said, I woke up every morning with like a knot in my stomach. And I'm sure a lot of people that are listening to us feel that every day. It's this, you wake up in the morning and, oh, why is this day here? I don't want this day to be here. Let's just let this night just continue. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then the fear of being in front of people and I couldn't face people. I couldn't make eye contact with people. And when God started to slowly heal me and you know, our pastor was always kept informed of our journey and they were with us through the whole thing. And when God started to heal me and I went to him and said, you know, I'm starting to feel different. And he would say, I can see it in your eyes hmm. because I wouldn't make eye contact hmm. with people. That was fear. It was fear. What are they going to see if they look into me? And then going to a grocery store, being in a mall, the sounds, the people, I would, I've run out of a grocery store, like I can't imagine how many times I'd be shopping and I'd just leave it and walk out, run out because it was too overwhelming. So the fear is so real. And that's just the physical fear, the strong physical impression of fear. And then there's the fear of what if people know? And then there's the fear of what are they going to think of me? And, you know, there's so many aspects of fear that I think anybody that struggles with this illness have to battle. It's not just one blanket emotion. It comes with so many threads underlying that it's so hard. And for me, that was one of my biggest enemies. 
I always tell people fear was my biggest, mm. biggest, biggest enemy. And I was so afraid of just, I started to become afraid of me. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, just fearful of who I am even. And it was so overwhelming to be engulfed in that fear. And so, yes, it is so real. You're not lying to yourself. You're not making it up. At least when I was going through it, I would say this is, even people have told me it's in your head. Mm -hmm. And and it wasn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to live in a fearful place. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't want to. No person wants to live in a fearful place, right? And that fear was so crippling, paralyzing, and you're not lying to yourself. It's real. It's real. Mm -hmm. I want to offer a kind of a prayer as we pull this to a close, Julie, because that's what's coming up in my heart as, as you're sharing this. Fear can feel like the walls coming in on us. And we are yeah. all alone in this box. <laughs> and I, I read a prayer. I'm not, I'm not sure who wrote it. Maybe someone will tell us. But when we feel so afraid and so alone, if we can imagine, yes, God's with us, but pray this, God before me, in front of me, God behind me, mm -hmm. and back of me, God above me, over my head, God below me, God beside me, on either side of me. He then takes up that space and the boxes, edges and walls are pushed out by his presence. God above me, God below me, God before me, God behind me, God beside me. Thank you for that prayer, Elisa, and special thanks to Julie's vulnerability and courage to pursue healing in the midst of her fear. We want to remind you that if you or someone you love is hurting, please reach out to a loved one or seek counseling. You are not alone. Well, before we go, we want to remind you that the show notes are available in the podcast description. You can also find a link for resources to help with depression or feelings of fear and anxiety. You can find this and more when you visit GodHearsHer.org. That's GodHearsHer.org. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget, God hears you. He sees you. And He loves you because you are His. Today's episode was engineered by Ann Stevens and produced by Jade Gustman and Mary Jo Clark. We also want to thank Kathy and Peggy for all of their help and support. Thanks, everyone. God Hears Her is a production of our Daily Bread Ministries.